I'm going to break all the rules today. I said to Lisa, as her training incumbent, she should pay no attention to this sermon because I'm not really referring to the gospel because there was something I wanted to say and I couldn't quite, usually you can get the message somewhere in the gospel, but this time I couldn't. So just ignore that. So yesterday morning, Shannon and I gathered along with about 70 other people in Brockwell Park for an act of prayer and solidarity for Black Lives Matter. We took the two placards, which you can see behind me. In the room, we listened to Kit Gunasekera from St. James's Church in Clapham, speaking of the profound transformation which is needed if we are to eradicate the scourge of racism from our world. And then we all took the knee. We knelt for eight minutes and 46 seconds, the time it took for George Floyd to die. In that long silence, I reflected on the words of George Floyd as he was being murdered. I can't breathe. And I reflected on my own part in the story of racism and harm, which has blighted our society for so long. Yesterday was also Pride Sunday. The LGBTI plus flag is flying above St. John's. The usual carnival did not take place, but there was a coming together of LGBTI issues and Black Lives Matter with a Black Trans Lives Matter march in London, alongside many others around the world. Next Sunday, the 5th of July, is the 72nd anniversary of the founding of the NHS. The NHS has been at the forefront of the nation's consciousness since the advent of COVID. The clapping on Thursday evening and the thanks. But there has also been recognition that the underfunding and the lack of preparation have contributed to the fact that the UK has one of the highest death rates from coronavirus in the world, disproportionately affecting many black and minority ethnic people who work in the NHS, including members of our congregation. So we've had three sermons in a row about our responsibility to challenge injustice wherever we see it. I spoke about breath back on Pentecost Sunday. I spoke about how we're called to enable one another to breathe deeply. Lisa spoke the following week about the need for us to hear and speak as part of Black Lives Matter. And last week, Wally Pazarski reminded us of the witness and martyrdom of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And today, I want to revisit why I think we have a responsibility to act and why we can't stand on the sidelines when we see the damage which is being done to the most vulnerable in our societies, to the poor, to those who are sick, or to those who are being bullied, targeted, or even killed because of their class, their culture, their skin color, their sexuality, their gender. I want to unpack why it is that we can't ignore the reality of climate change and why the message of Christian climate action and Extinction Rebellion is so interconnected to the realities of death and destruction which beset the world. And I want to think about how this all reads for us here at St. John's in our position of privilege and power with our wonderful listed building which sits on some of the most valuable land in the world, part of the established church with our bishops sitting in the House of Lords. And I want to think what it means for me as vicar, a product of generations of influential ancestors, some of whom must have made money out of slavery, the recipient of an expensive and elite education living in a four-bed house with a garden just behind the National Theatre, brought up with that sense of entitlement, which is so seductive. Isn't there a danger that whatever we try to do here at St. John's will appear at best hypocritical and at worst dishonest as we continue to reap the rewards of our privilege and nothing really changes? Or is there the chance that in trying to speak and act, 
we may be able to create a glimpse of the kingdom of God. And we may in some sense be able to live out the reality of Christ crucified and resurrected. So if I asked you to define the message of St. John's, the Christian message, in a few simple words, there's a good chance you might say, we're trying to live out the gospel of love, or we're trying to enable people to have abundant life, or we're trying to build a community of love. And if you did, if you said that, I would smile and agree with you. That's exactly what we're trying to do. But I have a strong feeling that is only half the story. And we haven't been telling the other half clearly enough. So I want to introduce a word which is rarely heard in this place, perhaps not heard often enough. And that word is evil. We're wary of talking about evil. We're wary of talking about sin, particularly structural sin. The sin which arises from the structures of society, from the way in which power is exercised in society. As a church, we're wary because we have for too long and in too many ways been implicated in the sin of the world. As individuals, we're wary because we ourselves, in so many ways, are part of the problem and prefer to avoid being confronted by that. But evil is real. There are things which happen in our world which cannot be described adequately unless we say these things are evil. These things are demonic. And we have to stand against them. I'm inspired by the work and writing of theologian Walter Wink, especially his book, The Powers That Be, Theology for a New Millennium. Wink spent time in Chile under Pinochet and then in South Africa during the apartheid years. And as he reflected and wrote and prayed, he reached the conclusion that we have to name the ways in which power is used to harm and to destroy. He writes of angels and of demons, remembering that in the book of Revelation, the writer is commanded to write to the angels of the seven churches. He understands angels as being a way of describing the spirit of an institution and demons as the things which distort. And he talks of the powers of this world, which too often have worked for their own purposes instead of for the purposes of God. They have made their own aims more important than God. They have become idolatrous and in so doing, they have become demonic. Wink writes, I had never been able to take demons seriously, but if the demonic is the spirituality produced, when the angel of an institution turns its back on its divine vocation, then I could not only believe in the demonic, I could point to its presence in everyday life. And if the demonic arises when an angel deviates from its calling, then social change does not depend on casting out the angel, but recalling the angel to its divine task. This was what the Old Testament prophets were doing. They were naming evil when they saw it, and trying to call Israel back to its divine task. This is, this is what John the Baptist was doing when he called people to repent, metanoia, and to focus on God, leaving their own distorted desires behind. This is what so many have done since, identifying the injustices in our societies and calling and acting to bring about change, to oust the demonic and to restore the angelic. So where does this leave us as Christians, as members of St. John's, as part of this complex and distorted global society? Especially where does it leave us when we remember St. Paul's injunction in Romans chapter 13, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. There is no authority except what God has established. The response to that is to point to the actions of Jesus, breaking the law, where the law was unjust, healing on the Sabbath, turning over the tables in the temple. 
or to point to the examples of prophets such as Martin Luther King, who wrote in a letter from jail in Birmingham, Alabama, responding to the local clergy who had deplored his actions. It is unfortunate that demonstrations are taking place in Birmingham. But it is even more unfortunate that the city's white power structure left the Negro community with no alternative. Jesus went through Galilee, casting out demons. And so, we are told, did his disciples. It is our task to cast out demons too. It is our task to name evil where we see evil in the structures of our society, which still, after centuries, institutionalize racism. In the idols of our society, which place consumption above community, so that we are devouring the world's resources at an irreplaceable rate and detriment detrimentally harming our climate and the lives of the poor across the world. In the priorities of our society, which too often put profit above people and tax cuts before the funding of services, with the consequences plain to see in the support which we are failing to provide for the most vulnerable. In the economics of our society, which has replaced the cheap labor of slavery with the cheap energy of fossil fuels with equally calamitous effect. And in the ethics of our society, which still judge people on the basis of their sexuality or the color of their skin or their gender or their ability or their wealth or a combination of all the above. It is our task to name the demons and to try to bring about the better world which we see in the life and work of Jesus Christ and the disciples and the wise and challenging followers who have inspired and influenced Christianity over the years. It's our task to do this in humility, knowing that we won't always get it right, and knowing that many of us speak from a place of great privilege. Above all, it is our task to do it in hope, because we know that the whole universe is held in the palm of God's hand like a hazelnut. And that the real power is not the power of hatred or fear, is not the power of demons, but is the power of love, which undergirds, holds, creates, and keeps every particle of God's creation, every leaf, every tree, every cloud, every star, every hair on the head of every person in the world. No good action is possible without good contemplation, without prayer, without community. And so today I hope that we can recommit to prayer and to action in whatever field to which we individually feel called, whether it's Black Lives Matter or climate change or disability action or calling for a transformed economy or campaigning for the NHS or for LGBTI plus inclusion whether we're working for St. John's on the bridge at Waterloo or the churchyard, because it is only by the power of the angels that we can cast out the demons. But casting them out with God's help, we can. And in so doing, we will, in our own ways, be helping to bring in the kingdom of God. Amen.